This is Al Sahara Al Kubra, in English, the greatest of all deserts, and the black people have dominated it since time immemorial. Except that's not exactly what you read here. A 2025 entry in the online Nature Journal titled Ancient DNA from the Green Sahara Reveals Ancestral North African Lineage. And you just won't believe what the authors did. Two things. First, they sequenced the genome from 7,000 year old mummies discovered in the Akakus Mountains of southwestern Libya. Now, genetic material is near impossible to retrieve from thousand year old corpses buried by the Sahara. Obviously, nothing is meant to survive this titanic wilderness not even genetic material. But in 2025, the authors of this paper did the unbelievable. Their conclusion after studying the impossible genome, quote, The majority of Takakori individuals' ancestry stems from a previously unknown North African genetic lineage that diverged from sub-Saharan African lineages around the same time as present-day humans outside Africa and remained isolated throughout most of its existence." End quote. Seems fair enough, right? Everybody knows North Africans are different to Sub-Saharan Africans, right? Just like ancient North Africans were different to ancient Sub-Saharan Africans, right? These mummies carrying divergent genes obviously meant a lighter-skinned population must have inhabited the Green Sahara some 5,000 plus years ago, right? Wrong, 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 and wrong. Things are not as they seem with this 2025 paper, which brings us to impossible feat number two. It's the authors who debunk their own conclusions. Here's how. Like, subscribe, and here we go. If this paper were a criminal case, there'd be one verdict. Guilty. Forget the prosecution. The defense alone is a disaster. Step one to debunking your own scientific paper. Call a witness to the stand who crushes your case. Quote, when restricting the comparative groups to present-day African and Near Eastern populations, we found that a group of individuals defined as Fulani A in a previous study, which includes individuals from relatively less admixed Fulani herders from eight Sahelian countries, shows an increased genetic affinity to Takakori. This finding aligns with Reference 38, which observed a non-Sub-Saharan ancestry component in Fulani A, similar to that found in the Tafarot and late Neolithic Moroccans. Using genetic data from a previous study, the 2025 paper admits that the Fulani, these people, hailing from across Mali, Senegal, Burkina Faso, Nigeria, Niger, and several other, quote, sub-Saharan countries, are more closely linked to the Takakori mummies than Near Eastern groups today. But did you catch the paper's clever tactic? It almost seems like an attempt to save face while poisoning the well at the same time, almost as if to downplay the link between black Africans and ancient Saharan populations. The article prefaces the Fulani group studied as being, quote, admixed or as having non-Sub-Saharan ancestry. But if you have prejudged genetic data of indigenous Africans to be of non-Sub-Saharan admixture prior to concluding your analysis, you are always going to conclude whatever link you find between ancient populations you claim to be divergent from Sub-Saharans as the result of the non-Sub-Saharan element. Mummy A is non-Sub-Saharan. These Fulani genes are similar to Mummy A's genes. Therefore, these Fulanis 
are admixed or non-sub-Saharans. It's shrouded in technical jargon, but that's essentially the shell game being played here, and it only gets worse. Again, look to the paper. Quote, the results indicated that the Fulani A have an increased affinity to Takakori-like ancestry, as do other Sahelian and West African groups. These findings are consistent with the archaeological evidence of the southward expansion of pastoral Neolithic groups from Central Sahara. Rock art, ceramic production and funerary practices provide detailed indications of the spread of these herders at the end of the Middle Holocene, probably driven by the progressive aridification of the Central Saharan regions." Close quote. What does this rock art look like, at least when it depicts people? You're looking at it, rock art found in the Akakus region and surrounding locales. Over and over again, they depict people who you'd be hard-pressed to imagine as anything other than black Africans, or quote, sub-Saharan Africans. Many of them looking like black Africans, wearing their hair like black Africans, with body types shaped like black Africans, and even homesteading like black African herders today. But remember the article's claim about the Takakori mummy's DNA, suggesting North African lineages genetically isolated from sub-Saharan Africans. Well, how does rock art and archaeological data dating to the Takakori mummy's era, depicting people resembling West and Central Africans, prove isolation? It doesn't. This paper is beginning to sound very familiar, almost as if it's regurgitating confused old tropes used by outsiders studying Africa in bygone eras. Charles Anthon, A Classical Dictionary, 1872 From what has been adduced, we may consider it as tolerably proved that the Egyptians and Ethiopians, or Nubians, are the same race, whose abode from the earliest periods of history were the regions bordering the Nile. In complexion, it seems the race was a counterpart of the Fullers, or Fulanis, in the west of Africa, nearly in the same latitude. These nations were not Negroes. W wait, what? Nubians, Ethiopians, Fulanis are not Negroes? No, says Charles Anthon, because if they were, that would make the Egyptians, who he says were racially identical with Ethiopians and, by extension, Fulanis, well, that would make them also Negroes. But we all know that can't be true, <laughs> don't we? It's almost as though this 2025 paper would seek to agree with these confused and outdated, dare we say, racist tropes. But let's give the paper its full day in court. Let's look closely at its supplementary data. This is the rough worksheet, the piece of paper an examiner might look at just to see how you've arrived at a suspect or incongruous answer. And surprise, surprise, there's a problem here too, a very glaring one. YouTuber Kamji owns the Kamjiverse YouTube channel, focusing on African and black diasporan history. But Kamji is no ordinary YouTuber. During the day, he's a professional structural engineer with a background in industrial systems. Meanwhile, Andrew King is owner of the King's Monologue channel a channel keen on placing ancient Egypt firmly within its historically African roots. He's also a peer-reviewed author, graphics expert, computer science graduate, and qualified teacher. Listen to both these individuals break down how the supplementary data 
gathered by the authors of the 2025 paper contradicts the author's very own conclusions. Essentially, I think he's saying that um, Takakori is like in between um, East and West Africans. Like it's uh, it's it, it's modeled as in between East and West Africans, which would make sense. So like you can see like the black, which would be TKH and TKH09. And you see like the brown right here. And then you see like the green. And so the brown right here would be like North Africans, according to the legend. So you see North Africans in brown and then the East Bantu and then West Africans and South Bantu would be the green and the blue. So you can see like Takakori and then the red here is like some of these Fulani samples. Like if you go down here, you can see red Fulani, Fulani A and Fulani B. So like literally, literally it's right here in B, like with the Fulanis, you have West and East African Bantus and then North <laughs> African. It's actually closer to East and West Africans than it is to North Africans right here and West Asians right here. <laughs> and you're Asians. So like 2.7, 2.6 debunks them. And if I go down the 2.7, same deal. Like 2.7 has a little bit of North Africans clustering back. But again, Takakori is closer to these. Oh my so goodness. <laughs> this is freaking hilarious, bro. Like this debunks them. Like this debunks their talking point, right? So it's just like, and this. Is so if you look at this, the, so this is a PCA PCA analysis, yeah. yeah. And obviously, as Kamji will know, they'll take the two highest principal components to run these, yeah. And it's always important to look at the percentages as well. Yeah. So if you look at PC one, that's eight point five three percent. So that's the percentage of coverage that principal component has. And PC2 is 0.53. So in essence, we have to take into account that PC1 is giving us 16 times the data that PC2 is giving us. Okay. Yeah? yeah. So the reason I say that is that it's much more important that we look for what matches along the, hori along the horizontal plane than the vertical plane. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So we're looking along. We want to look along PC1. So we want to see what matches horizontally. Yeah, because yeah. that's given us eight point three, eight point over over eight percent of the genome, as opposed to just a zero point five percent of the genome we're getting from PC two, which is yeah. largely almost irrelevant. So we yeah. want to see what's horizontally in line. So if you look at where the black square is, mm -hmm. and we look to the left directly horizontally in line, we have the Fulani. Yep. Yeah, and then to the right directly horizontally in line, we have our Kenyans. Yep. Yeah, and this is consistent. Every PCA test, we're going to get the same results. So if you scroll down to the next test after this one, 2.6, 2.6, we're going to get the same again. You're going to see the two black dots for Takakori. We're going to get the red circles, which are Fulani A. We're going to get the red triangles, which is Fulani B. We're going to get the red um, crosses, which is Fulani. We also, yep. if we scroll a little bit down, so we're looking. So this one is um, PC1 is more important. So we're looking yep. for what's in line vertically. So if you go directly below the um, the black squares, we got those that cluster of purple, um, a bit less. purple diamonds, purple rhombuses. That's our Maasai, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's who it clusters with. So this test is once again Fulani and Maasai are the closest cluster. We could yeah. go to the next test. Every single test is going to tell us the same thing: Fulani, Kenyan, Fulani, Kenyan, consistently. Yeah. Every single test we can go through. So them, I don't understand where they get this idea. So the next one is um, 2.7. Mm -hmm, this is 2.7. Yeah, 2.7. Once again, look at our percentages. We got 10% on PC1, which is the along the um, along the x-axis. Yeah? yeah. So we're looking for what's going to fall in line vertically. Again, that's given us almost well. That's given us five times more data than PC2. So that's really the the important part. I want to see what's kind of falling in that vertical line. And once again. Just below, we've got those um, purple rhombuses, which once again is going to be clustering with our Maasai. We've got our red circles, which is clustering with our Fulani A. And we've also got this red circle with a cross in the middle. Which is... <laughs> I mean, look, 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 at these, look at these West Asians. Look at these Eurasians. Look at They're miles away. They're miles away. They're not even worth considering. Do you understand? 
So these guys are very aware of that. So you know when they're onto a, a loss leader, because they'll say, oh, everyone was distant. And you know the only way they created distance between these Takakori samples and the African samples was by using that bogus outgroup analysis. Yeah. So they, you, that was their only justification for saying, oh, well, these guys don't, don't cluster with anyone. These guys don't relate to anyone. And you guys are looking right now in these multiple PC um, principal component analysis that they have in this supplementary data which proves they cluster very closely and they had to create a biased outgroup analysis test to create distance and even that's very easy to dis to disprove if you missed any of that here it is again the 2025 paper's supplementary data actually shows ancient sub-saharan populations clustering closer to the takakori mummies genomes than any other outside groups. As demonstrated by this graph used in the paper, when compared to the Takakori mummy, which geneticists retrieved most of their genomic coverage from, ancient East African pastoralists, foragers, as well as Central African foragers, cluster closer than ancient Middle or Near Eastern populations. But it gets weirder. When compared with modern populations from Africa and the Near East, Central African foragers, East African pastoralists, and even West Africans cluster closer to the Takakori mummy with most genomic coverage than do modern groups from the Near East. One has to wonder then what would have happened if the Takakori mummy's genomes were tested against modern Sahelians and not Central African groups like the Mbuti Pygmies of Congo. Yes, that's right. The authors of the 2025 paper missed out the whole of the Sahel from which to compare the Takakori mummies' genes and instead went to Congolese Pygmies and places like Zululand to find modern day black populations to compare with. Were the authors afraid of finding something similar to what they found? When they compared Takakori to modern-day black populations geographically closer to Takakori. In the author's own words, in case you forgot, quote, When restricting the comparative groups to present-day African and Near Eastern populations, we found that a group of individuals defined as Fulani A in a previous study shows an increased genetic affinity to Takakori. The nail in the coffin comes with the following admission, again in the article's post notes. Quote, the present day communities of the Tadrat Akakos region, the Kel Tadrat pastoral group, do not express a specific cultural or historical affinity with the prehistoric burials uncovered there. To borrow then from another great mystery, the late great Agatha Christie's Why Didn't They Ask Evans? We ask, why didn't they test the Fulanis, the Zagawa, the Beriberi, the Kanuri, the Tuareg, all populations that have lived in the Sahara for as long as records have been kept? Records like that of the ancient Greeks and Romans who spoke of the black men they encountered when first they arrived north of the continent, men they called Mauros or Moors and at times Ethiops. Why are today's scientists closing their eyes to dunes of bioarchaeological evidence stretched out across the Maghreb from ancient Libyan mummies like Uan Muhujaj, declared to have been that of a black child and among the oldest to have ever been discovered, to the black men and women dancing on the walls of Saharan caves, echoing the witness of Herodotus, Pliny and Strabo? What exactly did these ancient sources say? Click the video on your screen right now to find out and to see how Trill Black discovered the true face of one of Africa's greatest military tacticians, Hannibal Barker. From Kush to Compton, this has been Trill Black, no doubt.